evidently. And then who knows what's what's going on down there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Like wore shoes and oh my pants. god. You so, wear shoes? Yeah, I'm wearing shoes. <laughs> you wear shoes inside the house? No, usually not. But if for some reason I got dressed just now. I don't know. So for some reason doing Instagram live, maybe because it's a live thing, I feel like should be like show and tell kind of thing or something. So I was looking around for stuff to show, which I found something quite good. What is, is that? It's a picture from a panel at NATA uh, in the ni- early 90s at Spencer Nakasako next to me, leaning back like a Yeah, he's the one that looks like he's totally checked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I wrote on the back... Aniko Amori, which that's her. She's a cinematographer. She made a, made some documentary films. Anita Chang, who was experimental filmmaker in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Greg Pack, who I think is next to me, who uh, he made some films, and I think he does comic book stuff now. And Stephen Gong from Pacific Film Archive. So, mm-hmm. you know, since Spencer was on last night, I was looking around and I found this picture, which is quite... Yeah. Please send, please take a photo or scan that and then we'll, we'll post it and then this will be the, you know, digital ephemera that will be connecting us all. Um, This was the the panel that Spencer and I, we made a bargain afterwards. uh, Oh, this is the packed panel. This is the packed where we, you know, we thought it was a boring panel and we vowed to never be on a boring panel again so we said that if we were ever on a panel we would pretend to have a fight and we would bring prop bottles like glasses and we would stage a fake fight at the end of the panel and smash smash each other in the head with these glasses but we haven't been on a panel since then right on i mean what a what a narrative filmmaking technique to generate (laughs) fake drama yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> to make things exciting. Well, yeah. um, we're getting, yeah, we're getting a quite good crowd here. So I think we're going to kind of get started. So first of all, thank you so much, Roddy, for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, we are doing this Q&A because for the next 11 months, uh, with Sentient Art Film, a sort of series called My Sight is Mind with Visions. We are screening Roddy's feature, Some Divine Wind, as part of the program, as well as his second short, Four or Five Accidents, One June, dot, dot, dot. And we'll be talking about both of those today. Um, Roddy's long career, your experimental ethos, whether or not you saw yourself as part of a resistance of sorts within Asian American media, or whether that never crossed your mind at all. Um, We're hoping to get into sort of the nitty gritty of of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Abby and Keisha for digging out the the old films, which is great. I mean, and I I would recommend, uh, one thing I was saying to my students the other day, I'd highly recommend the series to look at because even though it's sort of umbrellaed under, mm-hmm. you know, Asian American films from the 90s, if you look at the range of films that are in that, you realize, in fact, you know, similar to, I think, all the movements that were happening at that moment, the, you know, the African American cinema and the new queer cinema that was happening then, that you find that, you know, a lot of the films are extremely different, varied in you know, approach, technical, you know, strategies, uh, you know, and it did get sort of lumped together. So I think if you watch those films, you realize that there's actually quite a lot of different types of movies that were being produced then. And it's a nice selection, I think, you know, sort of slice of that moment. So I, I commend you guys for dredging that stuff out. Yeah, that's, you know, that's our work. We are the sewer cleaners of uh <laughs> of 90s asian american film but spencer um so uh spencer nakasako who has a film called kelly loves tony in the series did a q a with the bellwether series at amherst cinema last night 
and he also gave a shout out to you and John Moritiguru um, in your work because he said essentially the same thing that what he thought what you were doing was weird and he loved it because it really showed you know um, the diversity of form that was being produced back then which none of us I think think exist right now and what's considered Asian American media or filmmaking um, that we encounter at least easily. So I would like to start this day, uh, start this off by sort of um, setting the stage. Um, based off of reading that I've done um, on your website, which is a pretty great archive of interviews and the writing that you've done yourself, and a found table that you did with Ria Tashiri, Shui Chang, and Daryl Chen for Film Quarterly last year. Um, when you were at uh, UCSD for grad school, culturally, I get the sense that there were a lot of the same conversations that we're having right now. It might have been called more like back then or politics is different but I see a lot of the same questions about representation assimilation politics identity politics and already back then I feel like Asian American media production was torn between a few different impulses including you know the positive image but you were in a place where you were with Manny Farber and Jean-Pierre Garon um, and you know, even now, I think they're still taught in art and film school for their outsider outlook, their, you know, termite art, to borrow from Manny Farber's essay. You've also always situated yourself in your films, but, for instance, in Four or Five Accidents, I find it super interesting because you don't appear on screen. We only hear your voice unless you do appear on screen, and I just totally missed it. Um, and to me, because the film is, a, you know, inquiring into the nature of seeing, failing sight, you know, language as priming us to consider the types of failing sight, it kind of begs the question for me about whether or not we can hear the Asian-ness in your voice, even. So could you just sort of set the stage for what things were like when you were in grad school and starting to make what we now would consider experimental films, a small room in the big house, four or five accidents, one June? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was at UC San Diego uh, as an undergraduate. And, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I still have a California twang because of that but I was born and raised in Los Angeles in LA. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't grow up in LA, in LA without being around the, the film industry, right? The, it's just mm -hmm. the monstrous presence. You know, we used to hang out and climb the fence of, you know, the Culver City Studios and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I ended up going to San Diego as an undergrad and kicked around for a while and then literally I started doing photography, I think, first. And, uh, and that had happened. My mother had given me a camera when I was in high school. So I had started taking pictures in high school. And the first pictures that I started taking were from punk shows that I was going to. So, in fact, that ends up in one of my movies. I went back and got those pictures. So I, at UC San Diego, I was taking photography. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a philosophy major for one semester psychology major for one semester, undeclared for many semesters. Um, and then literally, uh, I took a history of cinema class with Jean-Pierre Gorin, who uh, he, he just texted me, he may tune in, so he may, we may get interrupted. Oh, maybe we'll get a cameo. He may interrupt and say the story's wrong, but I took a history of cinema course, you know, not knowing what it was, you know, assuming that it was going to be you know, from day one of Lumiere and Méliès and that stuff. Mm -hmm. And literally uh, at, at, in San Diego, and this is, you know, the, the time frame of this, you could still smoke in classes. And it was a lecture hall of like, I don't know, 200, 300 undergrads. And, and there was no professor for about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. So it was utter chaos in this, in this lecture hall, you know, hundreds of kids. Mm -hmm. Throwing, I mean, I remember people were throwing frisbees and, you know, they had their dogs there. And it was just utter madness. And then 
Jean-Pierre, who I'd never taken a class with, sort of waddled in from the side. And he just walked up to the podium and he said, this is where the history of cinema started. And the lights went off and Peeping Tom by Michael Powell, if you guys know that film, <clears throat> played. And, and then the lights were on, went back on, and he, was, he wasn't there at all. And that was the first lecture. And I, it kind of just blew my mind. I was just like, you know, as an undergraduate, you know, taking a general studies course, I was just like, what the hell is this? And so I, you know, I started taking film classes. And then when I was doing photography pieces, I started using text. And then I just thought, well, I should just start making a movie. And so I started doing Super 8 stuff and then 16 millimeter. Uh, and I took video classes back then, but didn't, didn't like video that much, the, the look of it. Um, so, you know, uh, and then when I finished, I, you know, I got a, a BA. I, I was bumming around. I was still living in San Diego. I was playing in a band. And I was living in a house with the rest of the bandmates. And I was happy as a clam. And I was working as a delivery driver for a pharmacy. So that's hence the story of four or five accidents one June. I actually worked uh, for this pharmacy. And it was a great job because basically I got to be in a truck all day listening to cassette tapes of music and driving around. And for whatever reason, you know, whether or not uh, the other drivers weren't that intelligent or whatever, I realized that if I put tape over the map and I had a grease pencil, which is made from mm -hmm. film class, I could actually plot out the fastest way to deliver, do all the deliveries. And so basically I would do my deliveries in a quarter of the time and then I would just park somewhere and listen to music and hang out and then come back. And, uh, and then I ran into, in fact, it was, it was Jean-Pierre again. And he, he said, what are you up to? And I said, it's great. I've got this job. I'm living in this house with my band. We're getting in LA. And, uh, and he said, you're crazy. You know, you should come back to school you come back, I'll get you a studio, you know, you can TA for me. And so I wasn't really that interested, but I ended up doing it. I ended up, that was the only graduate program I applied to. And uh, it turned out to be really interesting because the graduate program there uh, was, was really, you know, when they say cross-discipline, but there were photography students, uh, sculptors, painters, uh, all together, right? So there was yeah. a group of- That's how it is now still, right? Still, yeah. It's still like that. Yeah. And you know, yeah. they, I think there was there was dreams of UCSD being sort of like the you know uh, the version of Cal Arts, the little bit south. There was a lot of New York artists that were there, uh, you know. So it was a very very interesting place. And so you know we were all together with with, to, with each other, learning about art and stuff. And so I think that you know. In one aspect, when you when you think about form and content, I think that was a big influence mm. on filmmaking. You know that that I that I wasn't only studying in a film program with other filmmakers, which I think would have would have really radically uh, shaped how I approached films. Um, you know, when 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 I first did interviews about four or five accidents one June, this short film that you guys are showing, people would say, you know, what you know what was your biggest influence on the film? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would say, well. A Donald Judd sculpture, like boxes on a wall, and they would be like, "What?" And so, you know, I really, I think that that influenced my thinking, and certainly Jean Pierre and the other teachers that were there. Babette Mangle taught taught there when I was there. You know, who's the uh, amazing camera person for Chantal Ackerman and Von Rainer, uh, and actually, she hired me to shoot something for her once, which I thought was mental. Uh, and uh, Manny Farber was there. I TA'd for Manny Farber. Uh, Steve Fagan, the video artist. Uh, and, you know, there was a great group of graduate students. Lorna Simpson, the photographer, you know, has done very well. Artist was a, a few years before me. Uh, the people in my class did pretty well as well. Yeah. So, you know, you know, really the interesting thing was uh, my exposure to Asian films or Asian American films really came through this layer of, you know, French experimental film filmmakers, uh, you know, uh, seeing, uh, you know, uh, Ima Moore from Jean-Pierre. Yeah. And also Danny Farber showing, you know, he loved Mizuguchi, uh, you know, and, and, and Ozu. And mm -hmm. so it was really 
interesting, you know, seeing that through Manny's eyes, which, you know, I think Manny for me is one of the most humanist kind of thinkers about cinema was one of the most humanist thinkers about cinema. And uh, so, you know, it really is touching, was touching to hear him talk about Ozu, these films that I'd never seen. And then the kookiness of, of Imamura really got. So, you know, it was kind of a very eclectic, you know, film education in terms of that. I mean, I don't think there was Asian American films yet that we had been exposed to. Certainly there was stuff that had happened at UCLA in the 70s, right? As mm -hmm. the same with yeah, I, know we, I hadn't seen any of that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. that stuff was in circulation. Um, you know, uh, although, you know, I did meet Billy Woodbury back then. He came to UC San Diego. So I started learning about this stuff at UCLA. But, you know, there was, there was much, it was much more difficult to see stuff at that point. So I didn't know the documentary stuff that was happening, you know, in the Asian American world. Uh, and I think that was one of the, I don't know if I would say it was a rift, but it was definitely some marker that when, you know, John Morisugu and Greg Araki and I, and there was a, a whole bunch of other people, you know, Rhea Tajiri was then at that moment, mm -hmm. a lot of filmmakers you guys are showing, but others that, you know, Pam Tom had this great mm -hmm. short film, Two Lies. You know, she was she was kind of punky back then. She she's now she's a PBS, big PBS producer, but she was kind of punkier back then. Uh, you know, and Mario Ponyo had these interesting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Roddy, a, wait. So, yeah. if you were sequestered in San Diego, how did Daryl Chen find you in your work, and oh, how yeah. did it show? at um asian cinevision well, that's a that's a very good question I mean, you'd have to ask daryl i mean i think i applied to the film festival oh you submitted like, and this gives hopes I, to everyone every out there I think that was the thing you know uh yeah. when i first did uh a small room in the big house i sent it everywhere and it didn't get into any festival i think it got into a couple small festivals but then the thing was that it got into the asian cinevision festival in new york Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, we, we can fly you out for the film festival. And I was like, what? With a 15-minute short movie? Uh, so it was kind of amazing, you know. And Daryl Chin, who was one of the founders of the ACB festival, uh, you, know, you know, also has a very eclectic background, comes from avant-garde theater, you know. Mm -hmm. So he had, you know, and, and was working at the Museum of Modern Art when he was 16 or 17, so he comes from an art background. Uh, and, and when he saw all this new work being done, and it was primarily, it was a lot of Asian American filmmakers that were coming out of film programs. He saw this as like, wow, this is a big shift. And so, you know, when, when we were programmed in those early festivals, when I say there was a rift, there was all of a sudden there was this big juncture that happened between the sort of community-based documentary work that was being produced, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was very well established. And I was, all of a sudden, these other filmmakers making weird animation or queer films, or they didn't have Asian American characters in them or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, but really, I think attacking form, this was the thing, you know, I think, you know, my background, when you, when you talk about form and content, I was taught that those are together always right then you know in, in, the, in the sense of in terms of cinema like Godard's explorations of of subject matter and also that the form is part of it right and so I think that you know we were coming at it saying we were doing content of whatever we were interested with but also trying to dismantle kind of form as well and that was you know I don't know if it was off-putting but I think the other generation of makers that have been doing more straight documentary stuff thought that this was some kind of weird aberration. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it was like, it's like, from what I understand, it's kind of a question of resourcing, right? Like, you know, we have a couple of Asian American festivals at the time, there's, you know, limited space slots, you know, attention, or at least that's how I get the sense that it is now. You know, you have something like CAM has limited resources. So, and they have to, all of the films that are 
funded at least through you know the open call have to be broadcast on on public tv and there's a lot stricter guidelines now compared to the 90s on what could even be broadcast so i feel like you know the kind of thinking is you know if we're going to come here to support asian american filmmaking why these people so i actually want to ask about that first visit to asian cinevision because you've said in interviews that the response was quite negative yeah it was you what, know what we, happened i mean primarily uh i think we were kind of attacked you know mm-hmm. the the and i think you know partly the friendship the deep friendship that John Greg and I have and and you know others that were around at that time you know literally like you'd go up for the Q&A and and it was funny because we were doing the Asian American Film Festival circuit so we would be in San Francisco, Los Angeles, at VC, New York, uh you know different cities and there would always be you know at least several hostile questions thrown at us you know and and you know and I, and i think um in some way you know it's this this thing that greg john and i came out of the punk rock scene i mean we talk about that a lot how much mm-hmm. punk rock was and so we, you know we were kind of not afraid to speak out and i think you know that that runs against some of the don't don't be you know obnoxious be be you know uh and you know there's there's that that element that has you know just just putting ourselves out there and we were getting really uh attacked for that ways oh did we freeze I think you're back now. Okay. We've just lost Roddy, but I will get him back because I feel like he was saying something quite interesting. Um and while I am getting him back, just I'm going to let everyone know we are taking questions from the audience. So if you have any questions at any point, just put them put them in the the comments box. All right. Oh, we're back. Okay. Back. Sorry, I couldn't tell if it was- I couldn't tell if I got disconnected or <laughs> uh, Well, um for me your screen froze a little bit, but we could uh, still hear you even though uh, I couldn't see you moving. Um but yeah, so you can see in the comments maybe you can't um but yes, people were saying like pixelation, uh, but we can still hear you. Yeah. yeah. So you were saying something about, you know, um like not being what people expected Asian filmmakers to be punk rock. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know there there was there was a shock mm-hmm. there was a bit of a shock i mean the, w- my parents came to a couple of my screenings, and one of the screenings actually was for four or five accents one June at u c l a and John's film Dur Elvis was playing mm-hmm. with me. and the two things that were funny was that um my print broke, so there was about a five minute you know thing so of course my like taping it back together or something <laughs> and my mother you know uh has this interesting history with elvis presley she actually my parents knew elvis presley's karate teacher in los angeles so in fact my mother took elvis presley's blood blood pressure once when he was having heart palpitation you know he wasn't feeling <laughs> so good and so they didn't want to go to a hospital so my mother actually took care of him and when she saw dur elvis she was like Elvis never did that. They never, I don't remember this film, but there's a whole laundry list of his drugs that were in his system. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that was, you know, shocking to, you know, the quote unquote Asian American festival audience at that time, because they were expecting to go see family stories. Right. And, mm-hmm. it, you know, and that was the kind of norm, I think. Uh, and, um, you know, I I, th- I think it's swung back to that now too, in some ways. I mean, it, and it, it was happening slowly, but you know, it's like you have the Indian American kid that you know is is stuck, and then you know every sort of permutation of that 
my grandparents came, you know, and they were very straightforward, you know. Um, I remember M. Night Shyamalan had a film at the ACV Festival that was that. His par parents coming over and not understanding, you know, mm -hmm. his graduate film. That yeah, I mean, I feel like that's still, like, those are still the films that we see at film festivals. And so at one level, you know, it speaks to sort of an enduring, perhaps, interest and need for those types of stories. But on the other hand, I'm sort of just like, I don't know, it just seems boring to make the same things over and over again. Aren't we past this point? Um, I think, well, I think, you know, there, there, I mean, you know, I always think that there, there's interest in any story, you know, so I think it's, but it goes back to how it's told. So I would say, you know, if, if, if to bring up the form content thing again, right? Mm -hmm. I think if the form is always the same, then that flattens the content, even though the experience might be very rich. So that, that for me is always the, the issue, you know? But, you know, uh, you know, I'm the bad Asian American because of those things, so I'll, always, right? I mean, I'm, I used to be on the ACV selection committee for many, many years, and then uh, I either got booted off or I quit. I can't remember. But, oh, uh, I didn't know that. So I would like to ask you some questions about that because there are, you know, a lot, there's a lot of um, discourse right now about, you know, expanding uh, the diversity of selection committee members, programmers at film festivals. Um, so I'm really curious to hear about your experience working for, you know, what's considered a niche film festival, um, but kind of proceeding along your career timeline, um, oh, past four or five. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. you moved to New York um, after the grad program, um, and then... So you made some divine wind in New York, I assume, or no? I shot yeah. it in California. You shot, shot it, in, it, but was that when you were, had already moved? Okay. Yeah, I had a rough cut of it when I left, and then I moved to New York and finished it. Oh, okay, got it. So yeah. I mean, so it's very much a transition film, both for you working on it as a filmmaker and. Um, I think really expanding, um, you know, the techniques and the repertoire of um, of elements in the film from what looks to be like, you know, kind of almost found footage, like um, like ethnographic e um, scenes of daily life to um, you know the non acting acting scenes, things like that. Um, it played at Sundance with my favorite Greg Rocky film, The Living End. Um, and what I really love about Some Divine Wind is that the main character, Ben, starts off totally assimilated. And he discovers that being assimilated doesn't save him from a crisis of identity, um, which I think is a super interesting um, take on the question of identity and because you know I feel like a lot of these narratives are about like oh make if we, even if we're talking about media representation it's about making it into Hollywood it's about you know becoming um or perhaps leveraging Asians uh, proximity to whiteness and like even in his bloodline for Ben's case because he's half um, Japanese. So I feel like it's quite provocative in content and in form. Uh, but because of, you know, this experience with screening at Asian American film festivals, um, you have been called with John and with Greg, the bad boys of Asian American cinema. But were you actively resisting this positive image narrative? Did you feel like you were working against something? Or were you trying to preserve something or illuminate something I mean, instead? Well, you know, the thing is that, you know, having done those two short films that were in the Asian American Film Festival circuit, mm -hmm. uh, which were not the first two films I did, I threw away probably three or four dumps before I finished, but those are the first two ones. Oh, yeah, but that's what everyone does. You know, you yeah. keep making the, films those, until those, your actual first film sticks, yeah. right? Because you need that label to gain yeah. value on the film. So, yeah, those are, the first, those are the first two that I made prints of. Mm. Um, but then, you know, the, the, the interesting shift that happened was that 
uh, the story of Some Divine Wind, which, which at the core of it is the story about this kid whose father has this breakdown and confesses the secret, which is the secret that he was an American bomber pilot. Uh, and that he realized that he was involved in this mission that had bombed his wife family's village. And so it was this whole thing about guilt. The craziest thing about that is that that's based on a true story. Mm -hmm. um, so I met in college. There was a, there was a guy who was an Amerasian kid who was in a rival band of a band that always got more gigs than my band. And then, and then one day he kind of disappeared and he, and I ended up asking people what happened to him, and he told, and they said this, mm -hmm. this story. Father had had this breakdown, confessed this guilty secret that he had kept, and then the family had split up, and he dropped out of school. And so the strangest thing was that I started writing a script about that, a fictional script, fictionalized script, and then I started incorporating my stories from my youth which is the assimilated, you know, having grown up in LA, that part. And I really wasn't sure if I wanted to do that movie because of the Asian American subject matter. I was, I was resisting, in fact. Mm. And, and the thing was that, that I always think about this with the films that pick up the, the subject matter. If I can't sort of stop thinking about it, there's something there and I have to then sort of dive into it more. And I couldn't get that story out of my head, that idea of a secret that you know and then projected guilt onto this historical moment and so that kind of became the, the 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 element that i couldn't shake and then i started thinking about my own self in relationship to that growing up in los angeles and uh, you know and, and what constituted identity growing up in la i mean i i, I grew up in a neighborhood that had, you know, cert certain amount of Asian Americans around there. But I went to a private school in Brentwood. I went to Brentwood High School, in which I was like one of two kids of color, three kids of mm. color. So it was like, you know, and I was a skateboarder, you know, I was, I was skateboarded in the swimming pool scene. So, I was, and, and then I found my way into the punk rock scene. So I was completely assimilated, or I thought, or I, or I hadn't really thought about my, you know, identity and relationship to growing up there. And so that story kind of stuck with me. And I started and it started dredging up all these things in my own life. And I started just making notes and, and writing scenes out in terms of that. But I didn't want to do it because I thought like, oh, I'm going to make an Asian American film now after, after you know, being the, the, the one that was outspoken. But then I thought that, it deserved to try and do it in, you know, in the type of filmmaking that I was working with, you know, in other words, not a straight narrative comedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was also when all the comedies were getting popular, you know, I mean, from Tampopo to a great wall to, you know, I remember the films were starting to come out and they were very like, you know, stereotypical, you know, they were the same jokes that dominant cinema was making about ethnic identity, you know, the awkwardness mm -hmm. of, things and so you know in my background in, in in filmmaking you know from from UC San Diego was which was a different kind of uh you know relationship to, to that so I thought well I'm going to try and do it I don't know what's going to happen uh but I'll try and do this film and and make it you know anchor it in certain kind of narrative cliches but try and do all these formal digressions in it. um I do think you know uh, when you say that it was at Sundance, you know, in, in, and this was 1991 or 92, maybe. Yeah, Greg, it's a very different Sundance back then. It and it was sort of the last gasp before, I mean, you were, you were on that. It was like, you were like, um, like last year that Alberto Garcia was programming or Alberto was Garcia was last year and, um, you had like a grace period before everybody else is looking for, you know, their sex lives and videotapes. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think, I think it was, um, you know, uh, of the Greg's film was not in competition. I think he, he was already a sidebar screening with the living end, but we <laughs> all, all hung out there, but I think seven of the 15 films in the dramatic competition were $15 million dollars. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was a very different Sundance. I think it was partly Alberto's real diligence to, to find stuff. But, you know, I think a few years before Todd Haynes had won with his film, you know, first feature Poison. Mm-hmm. But I think there was still this this hope that Sundance was going to exist outside of the industry. But then I went back the next year or the two years later, and there were just agents everywhere. It was, you know, obviously it had radically shifted. In, in the same year that my film was there, um, competition was Reservoir Dogs. Right. You know, that's, that's the and moment. Tarantino where, now, you know. <laughs> that, that's the shift that happens, you know, at that time. But, you know, that, but then that's the interesting thing as well, though, because I think when uh, Asian American filmmakers started showing at Sundance, you know, like Kai Ohata and these people, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden we're all embraced by the Asian American film festival world as the oh yeah we were the first ones to show them but in fact you know it's that it's that sort of validation that outside validation that that you know is important i will say this that i gave some divine wins new york premiere to acv didn't give it to new directors uh because they were the first ones to show my work so i it was important to give back something which is also why i was a selection committee member for so many years you know i i liked everybody involved in the organization uh we had differences of opinion as time went on though yeah yeah well you know it's funny when you know as time goes on and priorities shift we will get to that um but i have a couple of questions in the queue and i'm actually gonna combine them so the questions are um about some divine rind in particular and we have a question about the process of finding um the the found footage or archival footage for um some divine maybe if you could just tell us like what the sources are and what exactly was in there and then whether or not because it's so heterogeneous in terms of what you're putting together what you tried what were some of the things that you left out yeah well it was it was very very weird because i think i had a student job in the department and one of the things I had to do was log footage. And strangely and strangely enough, uh, there was a couple in San Diego where the husband had died and they donated all these 16 millimeter Kodachrome reels. Mm-hmm. And I had to log it. And the weirdest thing was that this couple, and this was just like at the moment I was starting the film. I think you are muted. Oh, wait, you're back. You're back now. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to move because my battery is getting lower. My um, strangely enough, this couple had, had one of the things they had done. I don't know if this is going to work. It's hard to Check out my battery. I think if you put your phone down sideways, it will still work. Yeah. Um, they, so I'll try. I'll try and go faster. They they used to shoot travelogue films around the world and put put together mm-hmm. little movies. And so all of a sudden, when I was logging this footage, you know, and I've been doing research about Japan, I found all this footage that was exactly what I'd been reading about. Yeah. So basically, I copied, you know. Uh, the 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 Kodachrome. We, we had an optical printer there, and I copied the footage. But it was you know it was illustrating all the text that I had been reading about. You know, uh, like the Japanese are the you know they're not as intelligent because the babies are heads flopped around too much on the back, and there was footage of all these babies being care- all this you know. So it was very interesting. Wow. So it was it was this kind of ethnographic anthropological find that just coincidentally happened, fell in my lap. Uh, and so that, 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 that's where that footage came from. Yeah. So it's like an archive that you were creating and that you also used. Actually, that reminds me, can you, um, so as part of my site is lined with visions, we are screening a, a swap me found um, film from your personal collection called Exotic Nippon before some divine rind because you told us that this is how 
you preferred to screen some divine winds and um you know going around to cinemas so could you just tell us like that story like what was the spot yeah. meet do you go to a lot of were there just a lot of random films being exchanged at swap meets at the time what was going on yeah you know that was from the swap meet in california you know like uh where people used to sell their own stuff and i i bought two boxes i remember but there was a bunch of them i should have just bought them all because they were cheap but this one that was called exotic nippon and then there was another one strangely that was called new york new york city and so those are the two ones that i bought and it was super eight film and once again similarly to that that sort of footage that i fell into my lap when i watched that it was totally about tradition uh versus modernity in japan mm -hmm. you know, like these kind of red yeah. light well i mean you have like all these people dressed in traditional clothing like getting off the subway for instance yeah or the train yeah, so, yeah. yeah so incredible it's you know, in, in a weird way, you know, it's, it's the, the, such an illustrative look at, you know, an outsider, you know, you know, like a Margaret Mead film, you know, what, what they would try and capture. And so uh, when I saw that film, and I always joke about this, I was like, oh man, I don't even have to make some divine win. I'll just show this movie as my film. That'll be it. Uh, Cause it was so great. I mean, you know, beautifully shot and, you know, you know, interesting, you know, interesting stuff in it. And so, you know, when I had that film and if, probably about four or five times where I've screened some divine win, I would just show that and not say anything beforehand. Uh, and if I could, I would, I would splice it onto the beginning of that because it's kind of perfect. You mm. know, except the, the other, my film. Um, yeah. And then so, one, yeah. Yeah. Weirdly, yeah, according to the date at the beginning of Exotic uh, Nippon, it is uh, 1963. So it is like a prologue to, yeah. to your film, for sure. Um, so we're coming on, we're nearing the end of our time. So again, if you have any burning questions for Roddy, please place them in the Q&A box, or you can just comment. I'm reading all of the comments. Um, but I do want to... Uh, move on to the films that are not in our series um you made another uh, your second feature junk was in 99 and it's a little bit more in the sci-fi genre i would classify it as um and um and after that you you made some things that are more more traditional documentaries perhaps um i mean they, they are um, I mean, nonfiction compared to the earlier work. Um, and then in 2000, well, uh, 13, 12 or so, you had a retrospective at MoMA, um, If Films Could Smell. So now that you've had a MoMA retrospective, is this it? Are you done? <laughs> well, I, I made them say that it was a mid-career retrospective. Ah, it's all about the framing and language. Yeah as we know from your film. So, so I, absolutely, I told him, I said, this is a mid-career retrospective uh, because of that. I mean, I've done a bunch of stuff since then. You know, uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I still like making films. Like, I like the whole process of it. So it's something that I'll do, you know, I do all the time. Even as my features get take longer and longer to do, this new film that I'm working on has been about six years now. But I've, you know, written three or four scripts. I've done about five shorts, you know, so I constantly am still working because I like the process of making. And I do, you know, I am one of those those filmmakers that believe that's a craft-based medium. So you have to keep, you know, at practicing it and, and, and evolving into that. Um, so, you know, there's always things that I've got, you know, on the side doing that I, that I like to do, you know, in, in terms of keeping busy. Uh, yeah. And teaching also has, you know, uh, I saw some of my students logged on. I mean, teaching also has inspired me to make stuff too, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. because, you know, the cliche is that you'll stop making stuff. And I was always terrified of that. But, you know, my students are constantly going, what are you working on? Can I help you? Yeah. So even if it's psychological, you know, yeah. if you're 
encourages you. So um, I think I'm going to end because Robert has a great question in the comment box here, which reminds me that I really wanted to ask you about your time on the ACP Selection Committee. Um, and I'm going to uh, kind of uh, preface Robert's question by saying one of the things that I admire so much about your work is the care in the edit of the film. I really feel like your films, and that's why, you know, your focus on form is so important. It's not only in production, but it's also in the editorial strategy, what you're juxtaposing, you know, the nested narratives um, in ways that, you, you know, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I guess the easy way of saying it would perhaps be nonlinear, but they, they kind of, I mean, they do progress um as films but they're doing such interesting things and i've talked to filmmakers that i've said things like after they watch one of your films it actually gives them ideas about how to work through a problem that they've been having in their own edit um so i wanted to pass that on because i've heard that several yeah. times since we started uh this series and so Robert's question is, what film are you most proud of pushing for inclusion during your time on the screening committee at ACB? And I guess I might expand that a little bit also by asking, what were you, um, what were you interested in championing just in general when you were on this? Like, what, what drew you to a film? I mean, you and know, what I, film are you most proud of uh, championing? I want to know the answer to that, too. I think, you know, uh you have to be diplomatic on those types of things, you know, like a festival or, you know, I've been on a lot of grand panels, you know, I've been on NISCA grand panels and, you know, many, many panels uh, uh, over the years. So you have to, you, you have to be diplomatic in some way. And the problem is that I, uh, you know, I have a tendency to not be diplomatic in those mm -hmm. situations when I'm fighting for something. And, you know, but I, but I think, um, you know, so you have to make compromises with, with programming and uh, uh, but I think, um, you know, the, the one situation, I mean, the, the, this will get me in trouble with the ACV people, but it's okay. They, they, they would expect it. You know, the, the one thing, the last year that I was on the panel, there, it was, you know, it was when Wong Kar Wai was very big. And I'm a, I'm a Wong Kar Wai fan. I'm friendly with Wong Kar Wai. You know, Carway. You know, when he comes to New York, I often see him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, love love all his films. Uh, you know, but there, you know, there was the whole film school swamp of young filmmakers copying yeah Wong style, which was not really understanding, you know, what the, his films are about, but it was using, you know, young hipsters. And, shooting under neon lights and it was mm -hmm. and my friends and I uh we always say this my artist friends we, we always say this which is you steal the engine not the paint job and so you know the, the there was there was a whole bunch of these films and I was picking them out in the ACD selection committee saying dead 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 mm -hmm. dead uh and then and I, I think I scared everybody else that was on the selection committee enough so they agreed and uh, the festival made a program called Films Influenced by Wong Kar Wai. <laughs> and I, I think, I don't recall exactly what happened, but I think I left a nasty phone message of one of those don't ever call me again messages, you know, like that. Uh, but, you know, I thought, I thought, you know, I understand why they did it, but they disregarded the selection committee's purpose too, in some way. So... What are you going to do? Yeah, so, I'm sure, actually, they thought that they were honoring you. <laughs> maybe, that maybe. that they, they were trying to show you that they had heard your criticism. Yeah. And you did know, it in a weird way. I think, you know, the, the question about what, to, what I would look for in champion. I mean, I think when I do that, I try and be really serious about it, though. You know, like you find in, in, in those types of situations, people are not really paying attention that closely. And so when I would look at films for the festival, I would try and see, you know, find things that would, you know, would maybe be overlooked or maybe, you know, uh, someone wouldn't see at first glance that would potentially be important, you know, that had potential. 
Because I think mm-hmm. festivals now, the way they used to be was that, you know, you would go to film festivals and not know what you were going to see. And that was the exciting thing about it. You could go every single day and you'd be surprised. Mm-hmm. And I think now the film festival situation is they all show the same films, number one. And it's all about who's going to come for publicity and, and press, or they make these themes mm-hmm. uh, yeah. that, um, you know, that exclude certain types of things. And I think that that's wrong. I thought the function of the film festival was to be exciting, you know, to, to show films that wouldn't get shown uh, elsewhere and to open up possibilities. And I think that that's the problem that's shutting down, like you, like you mentioned, that happened you know, that was quite rapid where it, it swung back the other way. Uh, and, and that's disappointing, you know, because uh, I used to love to buy two film festivals and not know what they were. I remember I went to see, I always tell the story, and it happens to be at the ACV Festival. I went to see Rebels of the Neon Gods, mm-hmm. Yang's first feature, just because of the title. I, you know, I just like, I got to see this movie this title is fantastic mm-hmm. you know, it was just you know it was it was a great movie you know i really love that movie so i think that that kind of uh you know aspect of film festivals has 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 really made less interesting but when i when i if i could ask you something like that whether i'm on a grand panel or a film festival thing i will you know really try to do my diligent duty to try and also help young filmmakers. I think that's the other important thing, that they don't do this, that, that I would say, look, this is this person's first short film. It's got all this potential, you know, why can't it screen with this other thing? I mean, it's more work. And I think that's why people don't like to do it. It's easier to say, this is gonna, cre- this is gonna be the crowd pleaser. So let's, that's the simple solution. Yeah, it's easy, I think, to fall back on shorthand when you can describe a film as, oh, it is, you know, Long Car Y meets, um, I don't know, Paperboy. I don't know, you know, like, or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, what an amazing experience to, like, also, like, stumble into a theater and see a um, timing man film for the first time. Um, yeah. There's yeah. amazing, yeah, cinema's a gift. Yeah, um, there, was, there was films that you would never, that would get no distribution, you know, that you could see at a film festival. That's why you went. Now it's like you, you go to a film festival and the film's coming out next week and they're using it as promo for that. And that's just not that, you know, it's not that exciting. Yeah, know? well, film festivals are now part of the distribution plans of, of films, you know. And uh, yeah, I do feel that everything from the program notes to even press covering the festivals in the US are just extensions of um, marketing plans. Uh, I covered Sundance um, for Filmmaker Magazine um, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that I noticed, because this was really the first film festival where I was receiving dozens upon dozens of press kits um, in my inbox, And I noticed for the first time that a lot of people were using phrases in comparison. There's one film that was compared to, like, Michael Haneke's films. But that was, like, the first line of the press kit, you know? And Mm. I was like, why are you using the film's own marketing in a critical discourse about it without at least citing it? You you know, you can say, you know, the filmmaker cites Haneke as a reference, um, does it work you know but yeah. um well i think you know it's it's several things now i think it really got cool to try and be a filmmaker for a while and then, oh yeah you've talked about this too like the professionalization of early career filmmakers like knowing you know i want to get the grant so i can get do this Is yeah that what I, referring to? yeah so, uh I've never been good at thinking like that, you know, like I should have done another Asian American feature after some divine win, but I did this weird science fiction film about my moving to New York. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, but, but, um, you know, I think, you know, 
it got harder again to make films, and now with digital technology, it got easier again. So it's shifting again. I mean, I think it's gone through these ebbs and tides. So I, I think, um, you know, I don't know. It's 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 the the discussion around forming content. I think is still the important one. Yeah. And I think that's really gets dropped away a lot. And so I think that's the importance of looking back at certain types of work, right? That's that that. Uh, I mean, one certain films that I watch once a year still. I force myself. I watch Lodge Door by Boone Well, and I watch News from Home from Chantal Ackerman. Those two films, I I watch them once a year, always, just because for me they 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 prod some in me to push me in a certain way uh, to think about form and and whatnot. But um, you know, but that's not. I'm not in the 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 mainstream of that, I think, you know, I think there's, a, there's a whole other realm. Uh, yeah. There. Well, you know, that's part of our job is to, to, to do this memory recovery with your films and others. So um, I have just been told that this room will automatically shut itself off in one minute. So I think while we are still uh, online together, I'm going to say goodbye. If everyone can say goodbye to Roddy and chat. Thank you so much. Um, the website, everything is linked from the Sentient Art Film Instagram account. It is sentientartfilm.com. And you can watch uh, Four or Five Accidents One June for free on the main page for the rest of this month. It is accompanied by an essay written by Aiko Masabuchi, really delving deep into the formal twists and turns that Roddy does with the film, along with um, Some Divine Wind, which is part of the package collection, or you can buy a ticket to Some Divine Wind on its own. And that is accompanied by an essay written by the freelance critic Ryan Sven about the aesthetics of um, assimilation politics within the film. Also another super smart essay. So thank you so much, Wadi, for gifting us with your presence in your films. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing another online thing, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Bye. Get back to your Zooms. Bye.